Good morning, my name is Bianca Wright and I'm a journalist, an academic, and perhaps most importantly for this TEDx talk, a gamer. And I want to tell you why I think we need to play the news in virtual reality. I became a journalist some 20 or so years ago because I believed in the power of journalism to enact change, and I wanted to be part of that change. I learned that even the smallest story can have a huge impact if it reaches the right people. In fact, the story that I'm perhaps proudest of was a small article in a community newspaper in South Africa. It was about the opening of a rehabilitation center for quadriplegic and paraplegic people. And if I'm honest, it was published in a newspaper that nobody reads, the kind that has more advertising than editorial. But somebody did read it, a relative of a paraplegic person in a nearby township. And she reached out to the rehabilitation center and her life changed. Uh, the rehabilitation center was able to offer her a rehabilitation to allow her to regain the use of her arms and to feed herself for the first time in 12 years. She regained her mo mobility through the use of an electric wheelchair. Meeting her was perhaps the most powerful lesson I've learned about the power of the media. Today, though, uh, fake news and an increasing reliance on social media has meant that there's been falling trust in what journalism is and can and should be. At its core, it needs a reboot in order to refocus itself on what those core principles really are about. If ever there was a time to reboot journalism, it's now. Percentage trust in the media has been falling. Trust in the UK media, for example, fell seven points last year, according to the Reuters Digital News Report. And around the world, percentage trust varies widely, falling as low as 23% in places like South Korea and rising to over 60% in places like Finland. Apart from the Times, the News, the Metro, and the London Evening Standard, all national daily and Sunday titles recorded year-on-year -year decline in 2017, according to the Press Gazette. Even with digital growth, monetization remains elusive and threatens the future of news globally. I was drawn to journalism because of the power it has to change not only individual lives, but societal views. The fundamental principles of journalism are about its role as watchdog of society, inextricably linked to notions of democracy. Yet news organizations are struggling to compete for attention, and as audiences continue to fragment, the role of journalism is being diluted, substituted for a growing emphasis on entertainment over information and analysis. Audiences are attracted by clickbait-fueled headlines that often obscure the value of journalism. Yet we need good journalism now more than ever. The major problems of the world, scarcity of resources, climate change, discrimination, poverty, need to be tackled by society as a whole. And in order to do that, people need to understand those issues. They need to be exposed to the realities of things that are often far removed from their own lived experiences. That's something that journalism has always strived to do. And that's one of the reasons I believe we need to play the news. I'm sure you'll say to me, Hmm. You've just said we're replacing information and analysis with entertainment, and now you're saying we should play the news. Isn't that the same thing? Play can be a very difficult word when applied uh, to serious issues. People tend to equate play with the trivial. So let me explain to you what I mean when I talk about playing the news. Play in this sense refers to the ability of the user to do something within the environment, to make choices and to have those choices reflected in the outcome of the story. So let me ask you, are there any gamers in the house? Anybody who plays games regularly, whether on mobile phones, tablets, consoles? Anybody? A few? Some very shy hands coming up. Um, Good, that's great. So when you play games, a number of things happen. For those of you who don't play digital games, maybe you can imagine uh, or remember what it was like when you were little and you used to play make-believe or dress-up. You'd enter another world, the world of your imagination. And that's one of the things that games can do. It can transport you to other worlds. So as a gamer, I've traveled not just around the world, but across the universe. And I've encountered people and beings that are as far removed from me as can be imagined. Think then about the possibilities of using those platforms to connect communities that are disconnected, to be used within the context of journalism to tell those kinds of stories. 
Gaming doesn't only bring together people, it also teaches certain things. So as a gamer, I've learned problem solving, resilience, perseverance, teamwork. In fact, studies on the ability of games um, to, to teach resilience are numerous. Robin Romick's 2004 study titled Game Time, Games to Promote Social and Emotional Resilience for Children Aged 4 to 14, for example, promoted a number of therapeutic games to do just that. T Jennifer Titian and Timothy Marvin's 2017 study on the PlayStation Network community found that gamers were able to transfer a lot of the positive psychological effects of playing games into their real-world experiences. And my own 2013 uh, research on gamer identity found that many gamers uh, reported strong feelings that resilience and confidence and perseverance were improved as a result of playing games. Gamers don't give up in the face of adversity. When you fail, and quite often in gaming you fail spectacularly, you try again and again and again until you overcome that obstacle. <coughs> Imagine if we use that approach in the real world. Billions of people collectively playing the news with a view to changing it, bettering the world, finding solutions. In fact, that's what uh, game designer Jane McGonigal proposed in her 2010 TED Talk. The difference is that while there's a recognition that games can play an, uh, an important role in engaging with these issues, no one has quite found a way to balance the wonder, the excitement, dare I say it, the entertainment of games with the real-world problem-solving that we need in order to engage with these issues. Play can be more. It can be more than just fun. It is meaningful. As a lecturer, as an academic, as a teacher, I use play to teach, to help my students learn, and quite often it's one of the most effective ways to do that. Serious Games, then, is that strand of game development that seeks to conscientize people to real-world issues. And it's already had applications in journalism. Here, for example, is Al Jazeera's mobile game, Psy Hacked, a playable version of the cyber-terrorism experienced during the Syrian civil war. By giving users choice, the news game offered them unique insight into an issue that was complex and far removed from everybody's um, everyday lives. But successful examples like Sci-Hacked are the exception rather than the rule. Um, and one of the biggest challenges, as I said, is balancing that gameplay with that information analysis. Getting that balance just right takes time. So how do we take this a step further? Immersive technologies like virtual reality give audiences agency, choice, and power in issues that they would otherwise be far removed from. Virtual reality has been called the ultimate empathy machine. If you've watched any kind of talk on, on virtual reality, you've probably heard that phrase before. I'm not wholly convinced that that's the case, and I think many of you probably aren't either. But what I have learned is that VR does something that other mediums struggle to do. It connects with people in ways we don't fully understand. VR games have the potential to move even closer to real immersion, taking people seemingly bodily into a virtual space and allowing them to grapple with simulated situations. And we've already seen their, their application within journalism. So The Guardian, for example, has a number of VR experiences. Some of them you may have tried. This is Limbo. This is their experience themed around asylum seekers. Uh, and it allows you to hear their stories. Um, as with many of these VR experiences, and there are ones on autism, on first year of life, variety of different themes, you are a passive viewer. And that's what I think we need to change. We need to move from being a passive viewer to being an agent of change. Now, many of you will have concerns about trusting an already untrustworthy news media with storytelling in a medium that is so ripe for exploitation. And to be honest, I agree with you. Building trust will take time. It will require regulatory bodies, news organizations, and the public to work together to build something that can truly take advantage of what these technologies offer. It will require grappling with issues of data, privacy, ethics, and law. And most importantly, it will require opening ourselves up to new ways of accessing stories about the world around us. Some of you may say, well, isn't this just a fad or a hype, the next big thing that's going to be here today and gone tomorrow? The same could be said for the mobile phone just 10 or 15 years ago, or the PC before that, or television before that. 
While these technologies will evolve and the way that we in interact with them will change, immersive storytelling is unlikely to disappear as the technologies mature. I admit, immersive storytelling is not a panacea, but I do believe that if we embed this into the broader media ecosystem, we will be able to harness the power of collective problem solving to bring our audiences closer to the issues facing the world. So let me give you an example from my own experience. This is Coventry Blitz VR. It's a Google Digital News Initiative funded project that looks at gamification, virtual reality, and 360 degree video. We partnered with the Coventry Telegraph, who was our media partner, uh, to tell a story um, in virtual reality. And there are two components. So there's a story mode, which takes you into a shelter where you hear Gene's story. And there's a game mode where you're taken into a cathedral and you play the role of a firefighter trying to save the cathedral on the night of the 14th of November, 1940. Why did we choose the Coventry Blitz? Well, there were a number of reasons. Firstly, because the Coventry Telegraph has a history, a precedent of innovating in its coverage of the Blitz. You may remember a few years ago them live tweeting uh, as though it were happening on, on the particular day, um, and also how they've merged together photography from the past and the present, as in the image behind me. In addition, of course, there were technical and logistical issues. So, for example, we had an existing model of the cathedral, which made it easier to build within time and budget, and we had access to the Coventry Telegraph's archive of photographs and news articles. But perhaps most importantly, the Coventry Blitz is something that resonates with people and with communities, and perhaps we weren't quite aware of just how much it did, did so until we launched this particular project. So we took this to a number of public events, and we also brought it into schools in and around Coventry. And what we found was it was an amazing connection with people. Most significantly, that it wasn't about young people engaging with the technology, although our school visits were amazing, but everybody came down to the public events. And in fact, we had people um, in their 90s who tried virtual reality for the first time with our Coventry Blitz experience. Although, of course, the response was mixed, this is a new technology, we don't claim that the experience is perfect, and everybody reacts to a, an immersive experience differently. On the whole, the response has been amazingly positive. And most people have indicated that they would seek out similar news games or immersive technology experiences in the future. Most significantly, though, for us, beyond the survey data, was the stories that emerged as a result of this particular experience. So, in the schools, for example, students were asked to respond to what they had uh, experienced in the immersive storytelling. Um, and many of them wrote poems and short stories. And the engagement between the students and the teachers and us as the project team was really amazing to see. There's a lot of excitement. It wasn't very popular with parents, though, because VR headsets went onto Christmas and birthday lists after we visited those schools. Um, so that wasn't very popular. But on the whole, the kind of engagement that we had was really heartening to see. And similarly, at the public events, people stayed behind. They didn't just do the experience and move off. They wanted to tell us about their memories, and this was particularly significant um, for those who had lived through or who had family members who had lived through the Blitz. So we had an 89-year-old man um, who told us his story about losing his father during the Blitz. We had a woman who recalled remembering the sounds of, of that night um, and, and a lot of other similar stories which were perhaps most significant for what we're doing. So we're not there yet. I recognize that. Certainly, playing the news VR Coventry Blitz is small in scale and narrow in focus, and the topic resonates with the community in a way that another might not. Uh, this is not necessarily uh, something for everybody, but it has taught us a number of really important lessons. Firstly, it's taught us that there is still an appetite for news, even if that doesn't translate into tradi traditional news consumption. It's taught us that people from the ages of 10 to over 90 are willing to experiment with virtual reality and give it a go. It's taught us that these immersive experiences elicit interesting and surprising responses. And most importantly, it's ta taught us that we still need to look more deeply into what these technologies can actually offer us. So, 
I think perhaps for me, the most important lesson that we've learned is that technology is not enough. The focus is not on the technology, but on the story. We need good stories to make that connection. We need journalists and users to work together to create news experiences that take us back to the core role of what journalism should be. The technology will change, and will change the way that we engage with it. But if we can put the emphasis on story, we can ensure that users continue to connect with that good content in immersive media. Imagine the possibilities of putting users in someone else's shoes, allowing them to see things from someone else's perspectives, and then most importantly, giving them choices that allow them to shape the outcome of the story. Imagine how we can report issues of discrimination, poverty, climate change, scarcity of resources, and conflict using these technologies. My challenge to you today, then, is this. Consider the possibilities. Offer up some of the possible negatives. Critique, but most importantly, experiment. Try new ways of accessing the news, play with the immersive experiences, and feed back to the media community so that we can start to explore the real potential of what these mediums have to offer. Maybe if we play the news in virtual reality, we'll start to have the motivation to enact the real change we need in society today. Thank you.